I want to open it up to questions. Uh, hands in the air. Let me see. Uh, don't be shy. Yes, at the back, sir. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a microphone right there. Years, Mr. Ng, what land use function changes do you anticipate? The current master plan identified the land uses for the airport. At this time, we don't contemplate any changes uh, to the land use plan as approved. Uh, we are in the process of revisiting our master plan, which will probably uh, be completed in two or three years. Uh, and if there is, and if there are any changes to that land use plan, we then have to seek government approval for that. But at this time, looking at what we have been approved, we're, we're living with what we have today. Bruce, any, any thoughts on that? Because uh, we're all aware of other, other airport cities, aerotropolises. Is that, a, is that something that comes along with the new vision for, for uh, Pearson? Look, look, I think Howard's actually best place to uh, to comment on it. But I, I do think that the, the, the thinking, the point I would, might build on that would be the um, the longer term planning is key, obviously, for land use and what's happening in the airport itself, but also what the airports will look like in the future. And as, as I mentioned before, uh, the key dates to, to bear in mind, um, our regional airport capacity will hit uh, capacity at in 2032, by 71 million passengers in, uh, in, uh, in the province in southern Ontario. What that requires is, given long-term planning horizons, is we really do need to uh, think about this today. And yep. it includes airport use, it includes land use as well. Um, so the, I, I mentioned, the, and then there's the other 24 million passengers we could also get through the system, $17 billion of GDP, that would pay for Heathrow actually, the uh, Heathrow <laughs> expansion, that we can tap into. That's a lot of dough for, for infrastructure it's build. It's in bonds. <laughs> <Right. Okay. laughs> it, would, it would contribute to what normal, um, which we could also get if, if, the, if we can develop a system uh, appropriately. So long-term planning is critical. Yep. Questions? Yes, uh, Richard Joy from the Urban Land Institute. Um, question for Norma and Thomas to, if you could, reflect on the, the more on the interconnection uh, between your airports. I know, uh, Thomas, you did a fair bit of that in your presentation, but uh, Norma, you, you actually sort of suggested that your, your main interest is international airports that you connect to and not so much the, the regional airports is, was, was sort of one, one of my takeaways. But given that we are needing to travel, no doubt, in, in the future between multiple airports in the city of Toronto, the region of, of well, really the southern Ontario region, um, what lessons can we learn about things that are gone well and perhaps things that are, have not gone so well in those two jurisdictions? Norman first, and then and Tom. Um, as I mentioned, uh, if uh, from an infrastructure point of view, it's easy to build two airports and connect something in between, as long as it's well connected uh, and have a fast way to go from one place to the other. Still, if you think about the end result on the end product and where, what an airport is about is to move people from one place to the other with the uh, fastest possible way, how do you like to spend 45 minutes to go from one airport to the other, to spend another half an hour to go to the airport over there? You have your own answer. No passenger wants to do this. Why would we build infrastructure that are designed for dissatisfying passengers? It seems to me, Tom, that what, you're, what you've done is to allocate different functions to airports. And is that the right way to, to, to manage the system, or do they need to connect into each other? Well, I didn't do it. but. <laughs> kind of, uh, kind of it takes some credit. It evolved that way. Um, you know, and, and years ago, there was always talk about um, a train connecting LaGuardia, the domestic passengers at LaGuardia, to go to Kennedy to pick up international flights. Well, that, that sort of went away because with the introduction of JetBlue and Delta and other domestic carriers at JFK, you now have the domestic feed to international traffic. Um, besides, uh, if anybody has ever watched Seinfeld, you know that nobody has ever beaten the Van Wick, so you don't want to be on a, in a car on the Van Wick Expressway. Um, but you know, our, our airports do compete to some extent, but they more, more than compete, they complement one another. So it's a, it's a little different way of, of having a system. Each airport serves its own role. But they're all owned by the same company. Yes, we're, we're right, all under the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Great. Bruce. Yeah, just let me add to that, I, and I think that you need to expand the question to include freight and to include business yeah. uh, uh, travel, uh, and and then segmenting the different uh, you know source and uses and so on, and, and then come up with a with a you know with a vision which makes sense across the entire network, yeah. uh, and uh, and whether or not well I guess in a situation where there isn't a single owner, it is a little bit more complex. All the more reason 
uh, to get around the table and talk about it, you know, uh, and, and collaborate to develop a yeah. vision which makes sense. I mean, it is interesting in the European situation that, that uh, certainly in the UK situation, that airports are traded back and forth. Uh, I don't know if, that, if is that something we should get into, Howard, do you think? Uh, I, I think the key is, I don't think anybody would suggest uh, we try to replicate the Mirabel and, and Trudeau, Pierre and Trudeau example here. I think that would be, uh, I, I think that's kind of experiment. It's been tried and not very successfully. But, but so Picker, the, Pickering is dead? <laughs> But over time, I think uh, there is, and I hear it from, from uh, Tom, and you see it somewhat in London too, there are specialization of airports. There are general aviation airports. There are airports that are very close. In. Like, for example, here, uh, Billy Bishop Airport. It's sort of a very vital role, uh, very much a market that brings uh, people that want to come right down to downtown Toronto. And, and that kind of specialization I think it's the thing we're talking about when we talk about system in Toronto. We're not talking about trying, I said, nobody's talking about two uh, fully uh, hub airport trying to connect to each other and try to move passenger between them. It is yeah. a more of a specialization. And where does that spe specialization go? But the critical thing is, if you even try to do that specialization, you don't have ground transportation for whatever you want to go to that airport. If you don't have that ground transportation, then passenger will not go there no matter how you try to plan. So that's why I think the key as, as urban planners, that's why as airport we plead, look at the whole connectivity. I think Bruce mentioned it, that last mile. Mm. Make sure that whatever infrastructure and especially the ground transportation network you put in, make sure that last half mile get you the connectivity to that airport so that in the future, whatever role it evolves into, it has the right connectivity to get people to all cargo or whatever else that need to go to that particular airport. Questions from the floor? Uh, let's, uh, let's have some here. It's been a fascinating thing. Who's, who's got some? Uh, so actually, yeah, right. but there we are, good. good, good, good. Uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, Craig White from UrbanToronto.ca. Yeah. Mr. Eng, uh, 2032 is we're going to, when we're going to hit 72 million passengers capacity in southern Ontario. Is that right? That's right. And, that's right. And, yeah. and that, okay, sorry. So then that's with what scenario in, uh, in with, with uh, Pearson specifically and Waterloo International and Mount Hope, et cetera, how will I, they be operating? Uh, yeah, I yeah. think Bruce... Let me comment on that. So, so the base case, the base case uh, scenario that I shared with you today, uh, basically, yes, 2032 is a key date when we hit capacity in the region that, that, we, that we have looked at. Um, now, included in that base case is uh, or are the, the, the current plans that, that Pearson has. Um, uh, to I think you add G and H and you add uh, Pier A, the satellite, but not a not, not a sixth runway. However, that, that 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 would be part of that. We do not have in the the numbers that I shared with you today expansion at other airports, which could well be a good idea in in one scenario going forward. Let's let's have a look at what everybody's planning. Uh, and then perhaps even separate the plans into what we definitely are going to do and then what we could do on top and see what that looks like. Um, but the 2032 numbers include today's capacity with a bit of expansion at Pearson, as is in their plan. Um, I mean, the, the interesting question on that, I mean, you see where what Heathrow has done. I mean, Heathrow has basically paved over the 427, 409, 401 intersection uh, and uh, taken out uh, a whole bunch of Milton. I mean, it, by, by comparison, that's what's being proposed there. And there is a lot of support for it. There's a lot of opposition, but there's also a lot of support uh, because they are recognizing the imperative of having to have one big hub. Uh, I know it's out of the box and bold thinking, Howard, but is that part of what you're understanding? Well, uh, I think we're still looking at one big hub. Uh, airport in, in Pearson, uh, and, and in talking to, to, this, to the airports around us, uh, I don't think anybody in any way are describing a scenario where we actually move Pearson's hub road somewhere yeah. else. But I think to, to, before we explored a, the, the, the concept that's been explored in Heathrow, uh, or uh, you say taking up Milton and, and many other uh, freeways around <laughs> us. I think it's it's important we look at all options, and that's why we started this this study with Mackenzie and with all the other airports that we are talking to today, and we'll be going back to talk to them more. Is what do you do with that? 
Mm. Is that the right approach? And as, as, as uh, uh, Bruce have outlined, one option is go to Dubai option, go into the desert, in which case there's no desert here, but probably <laughs> quite far out, and build a brand new airport. The other extreme is just let Pearson go to what it will naturally hit into a block and then say la vie. But I think it's more, uh, I think onus on all of us is to let's look into the future. Where will we go? And look at what are the true options available. And then we will come down hopefully within uh, next nine months to a year, come with what we think is a, a acceptable solution made for this region. So we, 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 we do have support from the community, but we do have some, some resistance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I do occasionally read the paper on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but an interesting thing, just a point, I was at a conference uh, about two, three weeks ago with, uh, uh, where the CEO of Dubai Airport was speaking. And, and, and uh, most of you probably will be aware he's a Brit too. And he is in full support of a third runway in Heathrow. So he don't want to eat the lunch, no man. He's in full support. I guess uh, the question that's coming to me is what you, you've been making a, a huge amount of stress on the ground transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, clearly, we're having a heck of a time in this province funding what we have to fund for the, the regular city. Um, can you conceive of a situation where the airport is saying we're prepared to make some substantial contributions to uh, those regional transportation infrastructure pieces that we need uh, in order to, uh, to get them going? Uh, uh, I, I think uh, if, I, if I understand and I saw what's uh, proposed in the budget, and I'll, I didn't go into the full detail that the yeah. provincial government proposed, uh, they have earmarks quite a bit of money for the first 10 years, I think over $10 billion yeah. for for doing a, a transit system yeah. across the GD. And I think in their view, this is the first 10 years, there's going to be more money invested. Uh, I, I think one, uh, I remember one thing, the key notes is actually the aviation sector is contributing to this. Yeah. Uh, I think you hear about, you heard about the uh, tax that's being imposed on fuel. Uh, I understand the, uh, the provincial government mentioned that those tax so that particular tax levy will be used and earmarked for, for ground transportation. So as an aviation industry, we certainly support that and we are, I think, financially supporting it at the same time. Yeah. No, I'm just wondering if, if, we, if we have to go to Hamilton, we have to go to uh, Waterloo Kitchener, then but, you know, we're collectively going to have to find a, a massive upgrade in those uh, transport facilities. Well, that, that's why we are now in discussion with Metrolinx and yeah. other parties and by the way, the federal government also announced some infrastructure money yeah. as to how best prioritize it, how to ensure it. And, and at the end of the day, we need to work with the community. Again, as an airport, uh, uh, one airport, I think it's very difficult for us to ensure that the right priorities are given, for example, for the Windsor Airport or Billy Bishop Airport. I think we've got to work with the airport uh, and, and, and working together, find the right way. But the key is, I think, before we talk to any community, let's make sure that we have an understanding of what is needed as part of this, this, this infrastructure need for the whole region, and not just from a one airport. Yeah. I, have a question, you, yeah. I have a question for you. <laughs> Will R.A. Dickey last three innings or four <laughs> innings against the Yankees tonight? They liked you until now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You're going to have to be a brave man again here. Mm -hmm. um, do I have any more? Uh... This one over there. Uh, yes, over there, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks for the great presentations. It's Andy Gibbons from WestJet. When we talk about Southern Ontario, I just wanted to get your comments on the leakage to cross-border airports, particularly Bruce. I'm curious how that factored into your forecasting and so on. We have airports that advertise Torontonians every day, and they serve basically as domestic airports. So some commentary on that and how important it is to keep a low tax and fee structure here in the province in order to grow? Look, it, it's a great point, and um, I'm glad you asked a question too, because the, the, the fact base that we've developed so far, I mentioned it's early stages, and we, we're, we're in the process of talking to airports, Metrolinx, um, the, the um, uh, tr uh, Air, Air Canada as, as well, but we, haven't, we have not yet sat down with all the airlines and talked this through and seen the implications, so that's part of the next steps here. It's uh, It's... Interesting, you know, how close we are geographically to the U.S. because, of course, <clears throat> leakage to those airports in the U.S. is uh, its opportunity. It could also be seen to be a threat. 
And uh, that's where we have some choices to make. Because the, uh, remember the chart that I showed, the 24 million additional passengers that we could uh, take here as a result of economic growth, those 24 million passengers could also fly out of airports that aren't so far away but are south of the border. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, why wouldn't we therefore think first about how do we optimize our own network here and be on the front foot, so to speak, as opposed to being on the back foot and thinking, thinking that one through. And there are, um, well, for example, Niagara, we were talking to the, the folks at Niagara a couple days ago. There's 11, 12 million tourists that come to the Niagara Peninsula, I think, Gary, right, in, in, the, uh, in the summer. What about that airport being able to fly folks directly in from the US and out to give them there for cross-border uh, approval, as opposed to them flying in somewhere else and then traveling down to Niagara on the Lake, which of course is a challenge. So um, uh, yes, we need to think about implications for the cross-border and, and Buffalo is, uh, is obviously very, very close geographically. But uh, let's think about it first as a, you know, an Ontario system, I think, and then think about implications for that uh, beyond. And we should come and talk to WestJet to see what you think, too. <laughs> I think uh, we'll, we'll close just, Howard, perhaps if, if uh, this is very much your, uh, the, your, your issue, you're obviously going to be wrestling that, with that over the next uh, many years. Describe your process and how this is going to unfold and, and, and how everybody, like people in this room, uh, will be involved uh, in your decision making over the next few years. Well, I think we've got to come back to it. It's not a decision for the GTA or the Pearson Airport to make. Again, uh, GTA only runs Pearson Airport. We only have one airport. All the other airports that you see in the map are belong to either municipalities or different companies. So I think it's critical that we, uh, we have, I think, developer facts to look at the opportunity available, look at the, the demand coming, and that there seems to be uh, a pie, and what I actually call the tsunami of people coming. Mm -hmm. right? These people are traveling around the world. These people are looking to come to Canada to invest, to be tourists, uh, to live here, to migrate here. These, all of that is going to happen. And we as Canadians are traveling more to, to go out there and do business at other part of the world. So that activity is happening. And I think it's critical we look at what are the options to meet that kind of demand in the future. I think uh, to be responsible, as planners, and, and most of your planner, I think uh, we can't wait till it actually happens yeah. before we start thinking about it. Why? Because again, to build additional infrastructure, or even to build infrastructure on the existing airports, is going to take many, many years. Uh, airport construction, you heard my friend Tom mentioning, trying to rebuild LaGuardia in, in an airport that is moving, and you're trying to take something down and at the same time build something new. That all take time and that it all has to be phased and planned. So our process right now, as I say, we're just starting the process, is to first, let's lay out some of the facts. We're now talking to the airports that are in the region and through them, we'll probably go engage the stakeholder of these airports. We're gonna engage the airlines. And like I say, this is not a particular process that we have a hot and fast deadline on, but it's one that hopefully at the end of it, in probably nine months to a year, we'll come to a, a it's after reviewing all the various options, coming to hopefully an option that, that we as a group can agree to, both the airline industry along with the airports, that makes sense to meet the needs of the growth of this region. Great. Well, I'd like to thank three wonderful speakers on a really important issue. Thank you very much for being Well, in turn, I'd like to thank uh, Joe, did a fantastic job. There's nobody better to moderate this kind of conversation than Joe Barrage. Thank you, Joe. So in 30 seconds, I'll say uh, thank you, uh, first of all, to our sponsors uh, today. Uh, thank you to uh, the GTA, who've been an amazing partner all the way through, and the staff, Hillary and, and, and team, have just been great to work with to present this. This is the kind of event, for those of you, and I, I see there's a lot of new members, and welcome to you in particular. For those of you who don't know you and I all that well, we are an international organization, as that, that our chair, Rob Spanier, said, uh, promotes the responsible use of land. And we are increasingly going to be presenting these kinds of programs where we'll be bringing 
a uh, sharp focus to the major regional land use challenges and opportunities that, that face us um, by bringing as much as possible an international perspective, which is something that we, I think, are well positioned to do. So I hope you'll uh, keep uh, tuned to us. Those of you who are not yet members, you might want to become. It's, there's very, very good value there. Uh, and we can sign you up, I believe, uh, yes, in the back. So there's an opportunity to take an extra couple of minutes. We said we'd go till 2 o'clock, so you got an extra little bit of time to become a member of ULI. So with that, though, I will say thank you again to uh, uh, Bruce, to Howard, to Thomas, to Norman. Uh, that was fantastic. That was an, an, a very, very interesting way to begin a very, very big long-term conversation that we have not heard the last of. This is just the beginning. Thank you very much.